Hello and good morning. It is such a great, great day and it is such a great crowd. We're thankful for each and every one of you. And what an opportunity anytime to assemble to worship, but especially now this time to focus our minds and our hearts upon the one who gives us all things to enjoy. We're thankful for you so much. We're going to be in the book of 2 Corinthians here shortly. We'll be in chapter 8, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, if you want to be turning to that chapter uh, to prepare us uh, to study for a few minutes together. It was almost three years ago that uh, little Josiah Duncan made some national news even. Living in Prattville, Alabama with his mom, they were at Waffle House one day, and he noticed a man in, in dirty and ratty clothes out in the parking lot had been walking around, and so he began to ask some questions, and his mom told him, well, he, he very well may be homeless. And for this little five-year-old Josiah, it was kind of the first time for him to wrestle with what that meant and what that was. And so she explained to him, he probably didn't have a place to live and may not have a lot to eat, those kinds of things. And eventually the man walked into the restaurant, and he sat down at a booth, and no one paid him a lot of attention. So shortly thereafter, Josiah gets up, and carries him a menu and says, you can't order without a menu. And eventually he and his mom convince the man, order whatever you like. And the man wants to order a, a small, meager burger, and they say, no, no, get, get what will fill you up. And he asks, well, can I get bacon on my burger? And the mom says, you get all the bacon you want, sir. We'll take care of you. And as the food is brought to him, Josiah just simply says, before you eat, would you like for me to bless it for you? And so he prayed a short, simple prayer where he said, God our Father, God our Father, we thank you, we thank you for our many blessings, for our many blessings, amen and amen. And his mom said after, after that short prayer, the man was crying and the workers were crying and she was crying over this simple, small act of this five-year-old. And as they left, Josiah turned to his new friend and said, if we see you again, we'll stop and talk. We'll stop and help. Loving our neighbors is difficult. It takes some steps. It takes courage. It takes sacrifice. But we often make it more difficult than what God shows it to be. We're calling this series a healthy church. We want to be the healthiest we can be as a church, taking sound, healthy doctrine or teaching and putting it into practice in good works. Good works are those things which connect others to God. It's not merely things that feel good, not merely things that look good, but in fact things that connect to God himself and to his purpose and his mission. And we cannot talk about this phrase, good works, and a vital sign of a healthy church without discussing this role of loving neighbors as ourselves actively serving, actively being generous in the lives of the people. I want us to listen to a key verse at the end of Titus 3. We referenced it several weeks ago when we talked about good works, but listen to the, some of the specifics that will help us with our study this morning. This is Titus 3 and verse 14. Let our people learn to devote themselves to good works, so as to help cases of urgent need and not be unfruitful. We've talked about devoting ourselves and being devoted to good works. Those are things that connect to God. And we've talked about the idea of being fruitful. Sound doctrine comes in, healthy doctrine comes in, and good works is what comes out. But listen to two other aspects of that verse. Paul first says, let us learn, let the, our people learn to devote themselves to good works. Now children don't have to learn to devote themselves to good works. Like the little Josiah, like so many of our own children, we are young, we love to give. But the older we get, the more we learn some negative things, the more we grow in our cynicism, perhaps. And we have to unlearn the world within us in order to learn to be generous like our Heavenly Father. And so we need this reminder that it's not going to be automatic. At times, it may not even feel natural to show our love actively as we love our neighbors. But also notice what he says as we learn to devote ourselves to those good works, it's to help in cases of urgent need. Actively showing our love to our neighbors is tied to their needs. Learning to devote ourselves is preparation for when needs arise. When big needs arise like storms or war overseas, 
but also when smaller everyday needs arise, learning is the preparing for those needs in the lives of others. Now, to set the stage for our discussion this morning, we want to notice a, a common need that's mentioned in the New Testament. It's this common thread that often is addressing some of our texts about giving on a Sunday even. And it's this famine that's going to set in in Jerusalem. So Acts chapter 11, you see Christians from Jerusalem, some of them with the gift of prophecy, end up in Antioch. One of them is named Agabus. And while he's there, through the power of the Spirit, he gives this prophecy that the whole world's going to be involved in this famine. And so when he says this famine's going to happen, listen to how the church in Antioch responds to this news. So the disciples determined everyone according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. They had some circumstances in Judea and Jerusalem that would have made it even stronger and harsher on them. So Antioch to the north, they determined according to their ability to send relief to those brethren. So verse 30, they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. So you hear that? There is a need, the famine, hunger. They determined, they decide in their hearts to give according to their ability. And then, verse 30, they follow through. They do it. It's a simple equation, but yet this is how the Lord equips the church as a healthy church to constantly meet needs and show His love to the world. Now consider this thread as it continues in the other letters. 1 Corinthians 16, for instance. Same exact need, all right? You've got Christians who are struggling, especially in Jerusalem. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so you also are to do. On the first day of every week, each of you just put something aside and store it up as he may prosper. Or again, according to his need, as he has prospered, so that there will be no collecting when I come. It's the same still need, and he's going about these various churches, multiple churches in Galatia, now the church in Corinth. And he's saying, I can't tell you an exact time I'm coming through. But in order for you to prepare and be prepared, remember Titus 3, learn to devote themselves to good works. You give every week. You give constantly. Now, that's talking about what we would think of in this formal assembly of the contribution. But the underlying principle is the same. We are best prepared for needs when they arise when we're constantly giving and constantly loving our neighbor and helping them meet their needs. So it's need-focused. It's based on what we've been given, and we begin and keep beginning and do it regularly. Those are the principles we already see just in a, a quick summary view that set the stage now for us to talk about some things from 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. Now, like that 1 Corinthians 16 passage, this is a passage both of these chapters are. We commonly reference in relation to the, the contribution of the church on a Sunday, and it has a direct application to that. But the principles underneath it also equip us to give and to love our neighbor and our brethren on a Monday or a Tuesday just as much as we will on a Sunday. So let's look at 2 Corinthians 8, beginning of verse 12, for this first principle. A healthy church is going to use its possessions, what it's been given, to meet the needs of others. So 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 12. If the readiness is there, then it is acceptable according to what a person has not according to what he does not have. For I do not mean that others should be eased and you be burdened, but that as a matter of fairness, your abundance at the present time should supply their need, so that their abundance may supply your need, that there may be fairness. As it is written, whatever, whoever gathered much had nothing left over, whoever gathered little had no lack. Opening verse there, verse number 12. If the readiness is there, it's a key word, and it's a theme that's woven throughout both of these chapters. Readiness deals with willingness. It's submission. It's not compelled. It's not forced. Remember later in chapter 9 and verse 7, Paul's going to say God loves a cheerful giver. And he's defined a cheerful giver as one who's not giving by compulsion, not reluctantly. But he longs to give. He loves to give. He wants to give. See, the Corinthians have said, we want to give to your effort to support these Christians, Paul. So Paul's coming back through now and saying, here's how you need to be prepared. You need to keep giving and keep digging deep to give. The readiness is there. Now, if you're willing, how are you going to give? What are you going to give out of? You'll notice next he says, 
Not according to what he does not have, but according to what a person has. We must be honest. Honest first about the needs we're trying to meet, but also honest about how we are equipped to help them. Both of those tenets that we bolded on the screen demand introspection and honest assessment. We're not controlled by what we feel. We're not controlled by what someone else gives. We're not even always controlled by what the person might say they need. We're controlled by an honest assessment, by listening, by empathizing, by walking with people in order to help them the best that we can. It's easy for us to get into a, a mode of thinking that would put us almost like a doctor where we're trying to diagnose. If we find ourselves saying and thinking, you know what the problem is? If that's the phrase we repeat a lot of times, that's probably dangerous ground. We need to listen with empathy and love people and respect people. And when needs are presented, then we can move and figure out what is it that I possess that God's given me that will help them with their need. That phrase also, according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. Think about how that touches every single one of us. Every single person is in a position to be generous and to help meet others' needs. Not because we're experts, but because we've all been giving something. We all possess talents or time or skills or money or food or clothing. So we all possess any number of things, and it's those things that the Lord then equips us and prepares us to use. So every person can say, I can do something to help meet needs. Thus, it's the intersection of what God gives and what someone else needs. It means it's our goal not to fix our neighbor, but to love our neighbor. Think about how God could fix every single one of us if he chose. He has the power to fix us, but instead he loves us. He gives us generously to meet our needs. He makes himself known, and our lives will improve when we seek him. But we love our neighbor when we give to them and give to them generously, not when we step in to try to fix our neighbor. But also finally on this text, for at least for now, Think about Put yourself in the position of being a Jew, Jewish Christian now. You, you've come to obey the Lord, and, and you have this Jewish background, and you're a Christian now, and your family are Christians, but now this famine has sit in, sat in, and literally you're wondering, what am I going to eat day in, day out, day in, day out? But you rewind several years ago, and you've heard these rumblings about Peter teaching the gospel to Gentiles and eating with Gentiles. Maybe that didn't set well with you. Maybe you wonder, how is that possible? Don't, don't they know that we've not gotten along, that we fought, that they despise us? Don't, they, don't we know what all they've done against us, the Romans have done against us? And as time has gone on, now the famine has set in, and we're wondering day in, day out, where's food going to come from? And then imagine the apostles coming in with these big bags of food, placing them before you and the mother multitude of Christians, and asking where did all this come from? Yes, it's the Lord who's given it to you, but how has the Lord given it to you? You remember those Gentiles? See, because they now share in the same gospel, and they share in its blessings, they have given generously so that you can eat, and your son and daughter can eat, and your grandchild can eat. See, to God be the glory, so that when everyone is working together and generous together, our needs can be met because we look out for each other. There's this legend uh, of two steamboats. They would frequently race in the Mississippi River, but sometimes there were stories of those that maybe unintentionally began to race. You know, male kind of competitive nature kicks in like you sometimes see on the roadways today. And so there's this legend of two that, that began racing down the Mississippi River on their way to New Orleans. And one of them begins to notice the other one's gaining ground and, and getting ahead of it. And they look at their stack of coal and they burn it all up. They had enough coal to make it to New Orleans, but not enough to race at the faster speeds. So are they about to lose this race? When one sailor notices, hey, we've got all this cargo on board too that we're supposed to deliver. And he starts throwing box after box of cargo onto the fire to burn the cargo. 
and he burns all of the cargo they're carrying in order to pass the other steamboat on the river. What are we going to do with what God has given us? Will we take what he's given us and use it only to fuel selfish races, selfish competitive back and forth about look at what we possess and, and look at where we've been and look at what we do? Or will we take what he's given us and look out and see there's a world of hurting people. There's a church of hurting people. And look how what he has given me and us can help these people who are hurting and who are without. There's two parables in Matthew 25, the closing of that chapter, that address this very principle. The first is that parable of the talents, we call it. The various levels, one, three, and five talents are given. Weights of money. And it's the one who's only given one who does nothing with what he's given. And he's rebuked by the master for not doing anything with it. You didn't risk it. Even though you knew my nature, you, you knew I expected you to do something with it. So the challenging question for that parable is, what will you do with what you've been given? And that question is answered directly in the very next parable, the parable of the sheep and the goats. At judgment, he says there's going to be two types of people, two crowds of people, the sheep and the goats. And he's going to look at the goats and ask, why, didn't you, why did you not do these things? And he's going to look at the sheep and say, because you did these things... I'll bless you. And notice just how simple and fundamental to life these needs are and how they're met. The sheep met them, the goats did not. Fed the hungry, gave drink to the thirsty, welcomed the stranger, clothed the naked, visited the sick, came and visited those in prison. Just think quickly of how basic of building blocks these are. And how we could start today with any number of these things and noticing needs that could be met. So you take one night a week and cook double what you normally cook for a meal, and there's somebody in this audience who could use a meal that week, or on your street who could use a meal that week, or who goes to school with your child who could use a meal that week. Think of how valuable a 12 or 18 pack of bottled water could be in your vehicle as you're driving down the road. To just keep in your car all the time to have a bottle of water ready to go. How much of a blessing is that now in our day and time to have that clean, purified water? And how we can then use that to bless the lives of others. Hospitality, welcoming strangers is one that challenges us, but what an opportunity it is when we have to welcome people in. To say, I have this blessing of a home, and I want to spend time with you there. Naked and you clothe me. Those who are familiar with working with homeless populations say that the, often the thing they ask for the most, clothing-wise, is fresh socks. Again, think how quickly we could buy a pack of socks that are warm and sturdy and keep that with a bottle of water in a car. And now, something that could brighten their day and help their feet is readily available to us. Sickness, we've observed this over the past two years, of how many factors sickness brings into our lives and potentially complicates lives. So how can we be more equipped to serve needs that come along with sickness, to come alongside people and to love them during that sickness. And of course, prison. Maybe it makes us feel a little uncomfortable to read this in the text. There are certainly those who are in prison for unjust ways, but even those who are rightly suffering out of sentence because they're guilty. Christians should have the most compassion for either population because we recognize a God who's willing to forgive and a God who allows us to avoid eternal condemnation because of the gift of his son. So every person that we cross paths with is a person who might have a need and we possess something which will help them meet their needs. Sometimes it is financial, but oftentimes it involves time and thoughtfulness and being aware. But quickly, to go back to, to the principle of 2 Corinthians chapter 8, there's this reciprocal nature there. You meet their needs out of your abundance so that when you have a need, their abundance will meet your needs. Notice how there's two ways in which that challenges us with trust. All right? So the principle is there from 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 15. To support that principle, he's going to quote from Exodus 16. Whoever gathered much had nothing left over. Whoever gathered little had no lack. That's a quote from Exodus 16. 
when Moses is talking about this manna that appears every morning to the, to the Israelites. So whoever had more was able to share with those who had gathered little. Now think about two principles that make this so possible. Number one, they recognized when they woke up the next morning, anything that was left over would have been spoiled. So if, if you have a more able body family and they gather more than they need in a given day when the manna falls, and you've got maybe an older family, a sicker family, and they cannot gather as much, well, the able body family is able to share with the other family and both have enough to eat. They do that because they know if anything's left over, it'll spoil in the morning and we have to still go gather the next day. Think about how that principle impacts us in our discussion now all these years later. We know the destination of our possessions. We know they're not lasting. We know that we did not bring anything into the world and we cannot take anything with us. So the Lord would say, because you know it will not last, you can share out of it and meet needs out of it because you know it will not last. But the second principle that's intertwined with it is that they also knew God was going to keep blessing them. They knew that not only, not only would their leftover spoil, but they would also be able to go out the next morning and have new manna once again that morning. And that's the principle behind our generosity. Not only will our possessions not last for eternity, but we also have the promise that God will bless us when we use our possessions for His glory. The text we read in our Bible reading that Tyler read for us this morning, Luke chapter 7, it's in verse 31, he says, to seek his kingdom and these things will be added to you. And it's just two verses later that he says, sell your possessions, give to the needy, provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old. The way we invest in our eternal future is to use our temporal blessings to seek his spiritual kingdom first, to be generous, to meet needs in the lives of others. But the second reminder from these two chapters, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 comes from chapter 9 and reminds us that we're generous, that we love our neighbor, we love each other because God is good and generous, not simply because we are. A healthy church is constantly giving to one another and to the neighbors that we face because we recognize we serve a good God, not an attempt to boast ourselves. So before we dive into the main text of 9 verse 12, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 19. We carry out this act of grace. Paul's saying our coming together and taking up funds to send to Jerusalem, this generosity, he calls it an act of grace. We know that term and we know that process because we are recipients of God's own grace toward us. And he says this, For the glory of the Lord himself and to show our goodwill. So he calls it an act of grace, and he says it's for the glory of God. The motivation is ultimately so that others will come to know God. Remember, that's our definition of a good work, connecting to God. So now chapter 9, verse 12. He's wrapping up this discussion, kind of bringing it to its climactic end when it comes to generosity. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 12. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, so that's our first point this morning, but it is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. Paul is saying because people are generous, more people are thanking God and giving Him the glory. Verse 13, by their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others. So it's that phrase, for all others, that reminds us this is more than just Paul's direct context of this need for Jerusalem Christians. When you're generous because of God's generosity to you, you're fulfilling these principles. Verse 14, while they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you. You see it? Because of God's grace toward you, you're able to be generous toward them. Verse 15, he closes it all up. Thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. That, of course, being the gift of Jesus Christ. But notice this phrase back up in verse number 13, or verse number 12, excuse me. Ministry of this service. Those are two words that we're so familiar with, we probably lose some of the active nature of that. Ministry of service. Now, that word for service is one of the secondary words that we sometimes connect to worship. It's very active in nature. 
And so it's the activation of your devotion. You desire to do it. You have this strong desire and passion. Well, ministry of that desire is the activation, putting it into practice. No longer keeping it as an intention, but bringing it into reality. And notice they glorify God, which should be our goal always, because of the submission from your confession. That's tying up the same thing we introduced earlier, that it's voluntary. It's our decision to be generous. Submission, confession are both things that we do voluntarily. We choose to do them. And people are glorifying God because you've chosen to be generous to them, he says. So when we struggle, maybe with a phrase we're familiar with from Acts chapter 20, it's verse 35 when Paul tells those Ephesian elders, it's more blessed to give than to receive. When we struggle to realize that's true, the answer is found in our text of 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 15. The reason it's more blessed to give than to receive is because God is at his very nature a giver. Thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift, 9 and verse 15. We find ourselves having some tension about whether or not we should give or how we should give to other people to meet their needs. Thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. There was a young girl who was over at her friend's house for dinner. And the mom had fixed a big spread of meat and vegetables. And she asked the young girl, do you like buttered broccoli? Do you love buttered broccoli? And the girl says, oh, I love it very much. And the friend's mom was kind of impressed. When they passed the broccoli around, the, the young visitor girl took the broccoli and looked at it and passed it on down the road. Didn't get any. And so the mom was a little confused and she said, I'm sorry, I, I thought you said you, you loved it. And she said, oh, I do love it. I just don't love it enough to eat it. I think we can empathize, empathize with a lot of vegetables in that regard. But are we guilty of the same mindset, justification when it comes to true love? Loving God and loving our neighbor. It's one thing to say we love God, but if we fail to actively show that love to those made in his image, do we really love God? It's one thing to say we love our neighbor. Well, I'm a neighbor lover. I love everybody. But then, if we qualify it and say, but not enough to actively show them that love, we're no better than her and her broccoli that she didn't eat. We think about the church in Acts being... The, the model church, the healthiest of churches to, to follow. You see a powerful statement in Acts chapter 2 and verse 47. All these things they're sharing it with, they're helping each other, they're worshiping together. And it says, the favor of all the people was upon them. They had the favor of even outsiders, the church did in its earliest days. And you begin reading in chapter 3, you see how that comes to be. You see a zoomed in approach. Chapter 3, opening verses. It's Peter and John who come upon a lame man on their way to the temple. And listen to specifically what they tell him. We don't have silver and gold to give you, but what we do have, we'll give you. Think about how that's connecting what we're talking about. With what they did possess, which was the power of the gospel and the miraculous ability to heal him. But they gave him what they had, and they healed him. And because of that, he glorified God. God. So they were equipped to show the love toward him that God had given them on a one-to-one -one level. They knew how to take care of one person. And you see that growing all the way into chapter 6, where they take care of a lot of people. And it's along the way that you read statements that, like, uh, that say that no one, um, no one said any of the things that belonged to them was his own. I may possess this, but it's not my own. It comes from God, therefore I'm here to share it. Later in chapter 4, there was not a needy person among them because they sold their land and gave the proceeds to help needs of those who were in need. Then chapter 5, they even carried the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats so that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits. And they were all healed. So now you see the church's spirit of loving neighbor and generosity has spread to such that those outside the church know those are giving generous people. They give what they have, but they give to us, they give to all. So then chapter 6 rolls around and you've got such a grand scale of generosity of feeding the widows that there's some conflict. There's some things, people that are falling through the cracks. 
And notice carefully, the apostles' response is not that they should drop the teaching and the prayer and the doctrine, but that they should maintain and preserve that and appoint qualified men to keep serving tables and do it most effectively. And so you see brought to a head here that at no stage should we ever compromise truth or doctrine, but neither can we afford to compromise loving each other and loving our neighbors actively. So just as much as the church is known in these first chapters for teaching the truth and suffering persecution for it, they're also known for actively meeting the needs of people who lacked with what God had given them. To love God and love neighbor is to preach his truth to that neighbor. To love God and to love neighbor is also to show the love of God to that neighbor with our hands, with our time, with our possessions. And we sometimes may hear the phrase that we can do a lot when we're not concerned about who gets the credit. That's a, that's a good phrase. It's a decent, cre- decent phrase in terms of kind of earthly teamwork. It's good if nobody cares who gets the credit. But maybe there should be a slight alteration when it comes to us as Christians. We should not get caught up with who among us gets the credit. But we should be concerned that God gets the credit. Why is it that you do anything that you do to love someone? It should be so that God gets the glory. And so think of the power of this phrase to help us in any situation when we're presented with an opportunity to love someone actively. Maybe we see a need, but we're wrestling with how to meet it. What if it's this phrase that we can pray several times through to try to get us going in the right track? To God be the glory. What would God and his generosity challenge me to do? Maybe we've begun to give and be generous somehow to someone, but it's difficult, it's costly. To God be the glory. What if after the the, the fact comes and someone wants to tell you thank you, or there's some big uh, effort to kind of give you some publicity? The best answer, to God be the glory for why we're doing what we're doing. And we'll see that when members, each of us, take the responsibility to use our opportunities and our belongings, our time to meet needs, that'll grow into more and more a church that's meeting more and more needs as well. A healthy way, the way God designed us to be. If you know that you need salvation, that's your greatest need right now, your soul is lost, this morning is the time to make your life right with Him. We encourage you, plead with you to come to Him, to obey the gospel, to be immersed in the water of baptism for the forgiveness of your sins. Maybe you have done that, but you know you've left the side of the Lord, you're, you're still standing in need of salvation, you can come back to Him where He promises to forgive. And because God is always here to receive you, so too we are as well. Come to a loving Savior. Come now if you need Him at all.